So the big question is this, how do most agents who struggle to get the information that most successful agents hoard to themselves grow and prosper without this information? That's the big question and this video cast is the answer. Welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. I'm your host, Pat Hyben. And now for the review of the day. Got a five-star review here from Poetry Jam. I've been listening to Pat's podcast every day while waiting to take my real estate exam. I'm so grateful for all the different viewpoints and tips that are shared. I feel myself gaining confidence before I'm even out of the gate because of how much I'm learning. Five stars, Poetry Jam. Thank you, Poetry Jam. Keep the comments coming, guys. I love them. And remember, I eat feedback for breakfast. So give me a one-star review if you want or a five-star review if you want. I don't care. And the more reviews we get, the better guests we get. So please, subscribe first and then leave us a review or wherever you're listening. All right, Rockstar Nation, we have a great guest today, right? I, you know, a lot of people have been asking me, uh, and there's been conversations on the uh, Real Estate Rockstars radio uh, Facebook page about, uh, y you know, when people post things about the blockchain, when people post things about Bitcoin, that sort of thing. And generally, I think, ah, you know, this isn't real estate. You know, what do we need to, be, you know, care about this for? Um, but then people are saying, no, 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 it is, it is affecting, it will affect real estate. And, and even though you're not out there buying Bitcoin or, or maybe reading the news on what it's doing other than your one or two friends that are becoming billionaires um, that used to wash dishes uh, and uh, wondering how legit it is, it, it is a concern uh, and, it, and it will be disruptive in a sense to the real estate agent sales market and i wanted to find somebody they could kind of explain like a third grader can understand right um what we need to know as real estate agents when it comes to the blockchain and i found a guy um he's with lannister holdings it's a public company um they specialize in uh lending money through the blockchain and they specialize in, in blockchain technology and and uh and, and it's going to be great. So, uh, Joseph Snyder, welcome to Thank Real Estate Rockstars. Thank you for having me. It's fantastic to be here. Um, I'm a fan of the show, and I, I appreciate you taking the time. And I only understand it like a three-year-old, so it's perfect. It's a perfect match. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Okay, so, let's talk about it, first of all. Like, first of all, why should real estate agents care about blockchain technology? Because blockchain technology is um, a better way of transacting individual group and, and, and finance transactions in general. So the, the reason that this is going to impact real estate agents as, as the job that they do and how they engage with it and everything else is that it is going to change the operating way that the middle and back end of these systems actually functions moving forward. You know, there's, um, there's a couple of use cases that are specifically touching the front end of the real estate market right now. Uh, there's a company out of Menlo Park and they have some people in Phoenix who, who we know and, and, and have, have spent a, a good amount of time with called Propy. And Propy actually raised money through a, an ICO, a, a token offering, and they have actually transacted the sale of a property in, I want to say Vermont, it could be Connecticut, it's, it's one of those two, I'd have to go look, uh, but on, on blockchain through the county recorder um, with cryptocurrency as the payment form for the property and actually transacted a, a property in the US. It's been done internationally, they started in the Ukraine a few years ago, they've done some things where you know it's a little bit easier to get legislative approval, but, um, but these things are happening in the real world they're happening right now, and the so, disruption. So I, I, I want to stop you because I'm going to slow this down. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so somebody bought a house in Vermont, right? And I saw the article on this, right, with Bitcoin. Um, 
in order to buy the house, they had to know who they were, right? They had to know, you know, the, you know, whatever. They had to qualify them. They had to ver the real estate agent had to verify that they had the money in the account, or they wouldn't have taken the house off the market, right? So, what is the big deal? Why couldn't they just wire it from the bank to the title company? It would cost thirty-five bucks, right? And instead, they Bitcoin it over. And they save thirty five dollars in wire fee. That's what I'm not getting. I mean, like, what sure. is the big deal? Sure. So, a, a couple of things. There's a couple of things that you mentioned there that are really actually big deals. Number one is the real estate agent has to verify that this person actually has these funds and is a is is a qualified purchaser in order to be willing to take the property off the market. The seller has to verify that these people have the funds. The, the amazing part about this is that verification with blockchain. And again, there is a big difference between blockchain and Bitcoin. Now they did pay for this property in Bitcoin. They did use a cryptocurrency to pay for the property, but the actual transaction was transacted on decentralized secure ledger technology, which is blockchain. Okay. The interesting thing about the blockchain is that it verifies those things for you. And the contract cannot close unless all of the party's um, obligations are met digitally and automatically. And the, the reason that it saves more than $35 and the reason that it's such a potential impact point is that there are a lot of processes, there are a lot of systems, and there are a lot of middle management positions attached to all of those functionalities of verifying the wire, verifying the chain of title, verifying the, the seller funds, the buyer funds, the escrow, all of that can potentially go away. And you can have a transaction that says, here's the value, smart contract, does it did the buyer put up the funds? Did the seller have title? Then the seller's title transfers to the buyer's wallet, the buyer's crypto transfers to the seller's wallet and your transaction is complete. You've removed all of those antiquated systems from the middle of that process. So in, in antiquated systems, you mean the title. I mean, you still need a title company. At the moment. At the moment. Okay. So let me, let, let, let and again, I'm just slowing this down. I apologize. Yeah. So, so the buyer, you know, he's going to buy this house in Vermont and Bitcoin instead of the the money, let's just, I'm going to pick a number. Let's say it was a half a million bucks. So instead of half a million dollars going from his bank to the title company, and then the title company verifying that the money exists, and then the title company paying out all the vendors, the termite guy, the real estate agent's commission, most important, and uh, all that crap. Um, then they pay all that out, and then they pay off the mortgage that the seller had on the property and then they pay the seller what is left. So there's, there's all that goes. And then, yeah, and, and before that, they pay uh, Wells Fargo for the mortgage that was on the property. So what you're saying is now with the blockchain, it would, all these things would be done online, I guess, somewhere. And the Wells Fargo would get paid off simultaneously. Correct. Um, with the real estate agent being paid in their account with the termite inspector being paid $45 in his account with the, with the mortgage, the new mortgage company being paid their points and, and fees. Right. And so all that would happen, uh, in the ethernet, right. It would happen in the air. Would, well, yes and no. It would happen within the smart contract itself. And so to, 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 let me humanize it a little bit. Yeah, please. How many times? So first of all, we own, my family owns a real estate brokerage in the state of Arizona. We own okay. a property managed com company in the, in the state of Arizona. We're in this business. I have been a real estate investor for 20 years. Um, did very, very well. 08 did very, very badly. Um, and everything 09. in <laughs> 09, 2010, 2011. Um, easy come, easy go, right? Easy come, easy go. And so this is an industry that, that we work in, but how many times as, and, and I've never personally been a real estate agent. I do want to say that I, I never, I never went there. Yep. I stayed on the investor side. Um, but my family is how many times have we gotten down to close of escrow and, Oh wait, 
this bill from the termite guy changed to this and oh it's you know what we didn't actually update that yet oh we've got to hold it over for a day or oh wait we're still waiting on verification of funds from the lender because you know this didn't come in and sally didn't send john the thing you know and we have all of this stress and all seller this. forgot to go to the bank get a certified check right. i mean the buyer forgot to go to the bank and all that stuff yeah somebody missed a signature um, all of these pieces are these massive, and especially from a real estate agent and a, um, and I assume you probably have a lot of mortgage brokers who listen to this podcast as well. You know, for the real estate agents and the mortgage brokers on that side of it, those are massive stress points, right? Um, as real estate agents, most real estate, there's the few out there that are closing deals every week, but for most real estate agents, you're closing a few very important deals to your family, your livelihood, your business, uh, per month or per quarter. And those stress points are very, very tough. They're tough on the transaction. They're tough on the relationship-based selling models that we all rely on to get customers to do business with us, stay in business with us, do additional deals with us. And they're human error issues that can be avoided. You know, in many, many, many cases, we are not the only company working on this. There's a lot. There's a company out of um, San Francisco who just last week raised $50 million to do home equity lines of credit on blockchain and through secure smart contract through smart contracts. So how would that work? Just just give me a paint a picture of how that would work compared to the process now. Uh, yeah, just just A and B. Oh, so comparison. Let, let's, I don't want to get down the, the, the rabbit hole of the home equity lines, but my point about that was, you know, Propy's working on property title transfer. Okay. Property they're, title transfer. They're right. specifically working on that one piece. We are specifically working on the real estate funding and um, origination funding and then securitization of notes. So we're specifically working on the pieces of blockchain that will interact with the real estate investor borrowing funds and being able to um, get those funds, acquire that property, make their payments through a smart contract, have automated payment streams, have um, all of these things built on, built on blockchain. That's what we're working on. There's other companies out there working on home equity lines and all, all of these different okay, pieces. So define smart contract. So a smart contract is a, a contract built on the blockchain system, depending on what it is, it can be built on uh, ERC. You know, there's, there's ERC-20 is probably the main no, one. I don't know what that means. Okay, so the Ethereum blockchain is a main chain that allows transactions to happen. And basically what ERC-20 does is it allows uh, people like us to come in and utilize a string off the chain for a series of events. And a smart contract is a specific contract, coded contract that automatically, openly, and securely does what it's supposed to do. And it's, it's open so everybody in the system can see whether or not the transaction happened or not, whether or not the, the things were completed or not. There's no murkiness. There's no, you know, there's no second guessing. It's binary. It either did it or it did not do it. And if it did it, then it allows it to move forward onto the next step or allows it to move forward onto the closing of the contract or, or whatever, those, whatever those rules are that are built into it, okay? But the, the disruption point is very, very multifaceted when it comes to the way that these technologies, not cryptocurrencies, I, I've never bought a cryptocurrency in my whole life. I'm, <laughs> I'm right there. I'm right there with you, you know? And so, you know, I have never personally acquired a cryptocurrency. I don't really plan on starting now. You know, we're really looking at the technologies here and saying, how does this technology impact and affect this industry in the near term um, and, then, and then in the long term? So as an example, in 1995, <laughs> we would have sat down on this podcast and talked about you know, I'm building an email platform for real estate agents. And you'd have been over there going, what's email? Why does it matter? Like we have these, right. you know, we have these, we have these systems. I go into a place and I send a letter and it gets there. I don't understand why I need this thing. And now here we are in 2018 and literally none of us could even fathom operating our day without email. Mm. And, yeah. 
And blockchain is that kind of a technology because it allows you as a real estate agent to know with certainty whether or not this deal is going to close tomorrow. Because there's no question, either the contract has been fulfilled and the pieces are binary, yes, they're done, or they are not. And you can address the issue that is the not part right away, upfront, proactively, and remove tons and tons of stress. There's a huge cost savings as well, right? These back-end systems, these middle market pieces of these, of these situations cost a lot of money, right? All right, Rockstar Nation, as you know, I wrote a book. It's called Six Steps to Seven Figures, A Real Estate Professional's Guide to Building Wealth and Creating Your Own Destiny. Gary Keller wrote the foreword, and I have sold over 30,000 copies of this thing, and uh, it is the go-to book for all agents, new and experienced, and it's been a really exciting thing for me to do, and I just love giving back. And so I made a decision recently to give away three copies of it. Everybody in the past has always paid in bookstores and online, and you can still pay if you want, but I gave away 100 copies last week, and it happened so fast, and so many of you guys reached out to do this that I'm going to give away another 100 copies now, and so this is a 200 total copy offer. Anybody could get it. I'm going to give it to you for absolutely free. And it's not going to be a, the cheesy version by any means. It's the same book that you would buy in the store. All you need to do is go to free six steps book.com. Free six steps book.com. All I ask is that you pay the shipping and handling on it, but the book itself will be absolutely free. That's free six steps book.com. You could also text the word Pat. Yep, my name, P-A-T, or a shortened version of my name, P-A-T, to 444-999. That's text the word PAT to 444-999 to get a free copy of Six Steps to Seven Figures or go to free six steps book.com. Get them while they're hot, guys. Free books here. And as they say in the baseball game, free books here. And so being in a position to build out the technologies and the systems and the tools that impact just this little tiny sliver of this market, right, um, allows us to scale this out from the state of Arizona, where we're based and where we're focused and where blockchain technology is very warmly accepted. The governor of Arizona is very proactive. He's signed legislation authorizing signatures on blockchain. He signed legislation opening a blockchain sandbox with the state of Arizona for companies like mine to be able to come in, work with the state and build tools and systems for the state's processes and essentially legalizing blockchain um, for use in the real world. Now, though that regulatory environment allows us to build and deploy these tools and test them in the real world, prove them in the real world, and then scale them out to the greater markets. Okay, so, um, so I want you to kind of take me down the road a little bit. Um, and I don't want, uh, so tell me what it will be like, right? Uh, a couple of years, I'm not going to say five or 10 years, I'm going to say, you know, two years from now. Sure. Well, just in the future, let's just say in the near future, you know, are we not going to need title companies? Are we not going to need um, uh, attorneys, escrow attorneys and, and real estate, not for, you know, lawsuits and, you know, advice and things, but for settlements and for transactions? Uh, I, would, I, would say, I would say absolutely there is, I, I don't foresee a, a position where we've removed the need for legal counsel and we've removed the need for human engagement within these processes. Um, first of all, there is a... But, but like, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me stop you there because like in, in, where I'm from, Maryland, the title companies usually don't even have a lawyer. It's usually a lawyer that owns it and there's about 30, 40 people that work there that aren't lawyers. Correct. Right? Yeah. And then I guess my question is, is are those, will those jobs eventually be eliminated? I, I, w I would say almost certainly yes, and to a large degree. I would, you know, where w the example is, is that 
a title company's job is to verify a chain of title. That's very, very simple, right? That's, a, that's an absolutely clear cut definition of what they are there to do. Um, the interesting thing about blockchain is blockchain. <laughs> it is very specifically a chain of title. That's what a blockchain is. It is a secure, absolutely verifiable, is this the next block in the chain? Is this the next sequence in the event? Did this happen, yes or no? And traditional title, especially in real estate, especially in the US, um, is specifically designed to go research the last 200 years of history on that particular APN number, on that particular property, and say, did it, did it follow all the way through? Did the right people sign off at the right times? And did this transfer actually happen so that we can end up today on something that is essentially financeable, mortgageable, uh, with a clear title? And so over the next couple of years, I believe that we will see disruption, specifically in the title space, um, where there's going to be a large swath of the workload and the um, insurance risk load and the operation cost that is going to go away because utilizing blockchain for securing title and verifying the chain of events is just a better way. Um, as an example, and it's not particular to real estate, but as an example, Walmart built a blockchain verification system for a piece of their supply chain. And what they wanted to do was be able to track this, the, the, the product, its um, components, all the way from source to store. And that process took them three weeks to do with their traditional methods. That's verifying the invoices from the bills of lading, to, you know, tracking the shipment through, verifying that it got to the port, and then transferring it to the truck, intermodal transport, all the way through to the shelf, right? That's a, th a three-week process. Um, I don't know the exact time frame, but I think once they built the blockchain system, they were able to verify that transaction in about two to three seconds with blockchain. Um, that's going to remove a lot of jobs. Yeah. Do you think it will eliminate lenders and owners title insurance? No, the insurance product is still needed because, um, because humans love insurance. <laughs> Because we love knowing that somebody, if something is wrong that we don't know about, that somebody else is on the hook for. Will it make it go up? I think it'll make it go down because it's a much more secure, much more transparent system. Yeah, so, and, and it's, a, it, you know, it's, it's an 80% commission product. Right. It's, it's, a very, it's, a very low, it's a very low risk product to begin with. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and it's a very entrenched market. Um, and, and I think the impact there is huge. The impact you might, maybe you could buy it online at, at, at some point because of how everything we get streamed. I'm, I'm trying to see how that 80% would be disrupted, right? Like the, the 60 to 80% to 60 to 9 value stone in a title company. I get, the, I get it, right? Um, that, that's in there that they're paying the lawyers and, and the title companies. Um, if you could do it all online and you can see the blockchain online, uh, certainly there will be a disruptive company that says I'll insure it. And, and you, you don't know. need all these humans. You don't need all, all these humans and all, 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 all those cost bases. And my commission will be 5% rather than 80. Well, that's exactly right. But the reason that that commission is 80% is not because somebody's making massive profits. The profit margins on title are actually relatively small at the end of the day because the fixed operating costs are massive. Right. Yeah. They've got the huge offices and they've got 30 employees running around, you know, expensive. Balances. Yeah. you know, it's expensive, but to put it in a way that might be a little bit easier to understand, do we all believe that self-driving cars are the future? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you really think that car insurance, just because the cars are autonomous is going to go away completely? No, somebody still has to have a financial security, especially if self-driving cars are owned by two or three large corporations. And then, you know, we kind of decentralize ownership of automobiles, which makes a lot of sense, right? I have expensive cars and they sit here half the time. Mm, interesting. Right. But that doesn't mean that the insurance product itself goes away. It does drastically change. You no longer need these massive pools of risk, um, you know, of, of, of risk capital to absorb losses from thousands and thousands of incidents a day from thousands and thousands of owners. 
right? You need essentially what is um, catastrophe coverage to cover one or two things going wrong inside of a system over, you know, a period of time. What do you think about the word toolbox? What is a toolbox? A toolbox is a box full of tools that you use to build something great. At Real Estate Rockstars, we've created our own free toolbox. So everybody that comes on the show as a guest brings a tool with them and we plow them all into this toolbox and we give it away for our viewing audience to basically use as they wish. Everything we put in there is an actionable item that can be downloaded, can be printed, can be used immediately. And we got things like scripts and dialogues, checklists for teams, checklists to keep agents accountable, referral forms that are filled out at settlement to get referrals by your buyers and sellers. Everything you could think of that you could use on a regular basis about real estate is included in this toolbox. And it's helping agents worldwide sell more houses and make their jobs a lot easier and processes much more efficient. And the thing is, it's absolutely free. All you gotta do is go to hybendigital.com backslash toolbox or text the word toolbox to 444-999. That's toolbox 444-999. Do it now. Wow. Let, let's switch a minute to mortgages because I love this conversation, Joe. I mean, it's like we're, you know, we're, we're thinking far out, right? We're, we're, we're kind of being economists in a sense. We're predicting the future a little bit. Um, you know, how is this going to change mortgages? How is this going to change the role of a mortgage officer? Um, you know, g g give me some ideas there. Well, on the front end side of that, that's an interesting question that I, I, I don't know that I see that path yet. You know, I have, um, I have owned a lot of first trustee mortgages in my life. You know, I've, I've bought and sold a lot of land and, and that's kind of a business that you kind of end up taking, you know, taking back some trustees and things. And so I've owned many a mortgage um, uh, from a lender standpoint. Um, I've, I've got a mortgage on this house that I'm sitting in right now. So, you know, there, there's that whole thing. But for us, what we're looking at on the mortgage side is, again, the entrenched back end cost basis of facilitating this business. And what I mean by that is this, the loan um, ownership process. So when you get a mortgage, uh, you get your loan, you close your escrow, you're super happy, you got your new house, you move in, 90 days later, you get a letter from the bank and they say, a XYZ Financial no longer owns your loan. Now Lannister Capital owns your loan. Okay. And you still make your payment. It still goes to a servicing company. You don't really care. Your terms are the same. Your interest rates the same, but the financial institution change. The, the, in the U S market, the average mortgage, and you may know the numbers better than I do, but the average mortgage actually lasts about five years, right? Five to six years. People refi, they move, et cetera, et cetera. So yep. you sign, you sign a 30 year loan, you keep it five years in that five year period of time. I think that the average is that that note is transacted on the back end between the banks four to five times. Mm, okay. okay. So what we're looking at is where are the failure points on the back end of that system? Where are the cost bases on the back end of that system? Because these financial institutions are incurring risk. They're incurring cost. They're incurring uh, time and investment in transacting these notes after they've been originated. After you have a borrower in a house making a payment, um, and a great example is, you know, Bank of America um, <laughs> bought Countrywide. They wish they hadn't, but they did. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and what came with Countrywide was a massive unknown risk pool mm -hmm. of all of these human uh, computational procedural errors that happened on thousands and thousands of loans and ended up being a quagmire of billions of dollars in losses and fines because houses were foreclosed on that should not have been foreclosed on. Loans were transferred that should not have been transferred. Loans were insured that never should have been insured. And so you end up with a unquantified risk basis to the financial institutions. And what we're looking at is the ability to put that note and that ownership of that um, financial instrument 
in a secure digital ledger. So there's no question if, if bank A transfers this to bank B, it's a, it's a zero to one event, right? It was right, because, because you were saying because when Bank of America bought, you know, all these loans or took over all these loans for Countrywide, um, they didn't look at them all. They didn't know about them all. They didn't know how many times they had been transferred, where they came from. Now, let's say that blockchain existed when that transaction took place, when Countrywide was bought. And by the way, you know, if you weren't in the business then, I mean, Countrywide was massive, right? It was, Countrywide was massive. It was Countrywide. And if, we're being, and if we're being honest, like Bank of America had no choice. I think the feds came in and said, you're yeah, buying they made them. Right, they you're, made them. You're, you're buying this today. Have a nice day. So if blockchain existed, how would it be different? You, you, uh, you wouldn't have bought Countrywide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would have seen, right? But what would, would have they have seen? seen? Like, you know. Um, well, a couple of things. First of all, if all of the loans that Countrywide did had been originated and funded and securitized on blockchain, um, there never would have been a question about whether or not Countrywide was still viable. It would have been, right? Um, because they could not have transacted the business that way in an open and, and, and secure platform. It couldn't have happened, first of all. So you take the impetus out. But secondarily to that, from a mergers and acquisition standpoint, from an acquirer standpoint, I can then look at these things and say, no, <laughs> those don't, you know, those don't actually match. You know, these, these contracts aren't actually all the way through to the end. So we're not going to go ahead and accept that risk. And there's two pieces to that the way that I see it from a business perspective, right? I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a tech guy. I've got lots of tech guys. My CTO is a brilliant tech guy. We've got the, just world-class amazing people on the technology side, but I'm a business guy. And from the business standpoint, there's two things to look at. Number one is, what is the cost basis? What does it cost Bank of America, since we're using them as an example, yes. to facilitate all of these mortgage-backed securities, uh, foreclosure transactions, all of these individual transactions and these grouped transactions Church on the sales, back, all that, yeah, all this stuff. What does that cost per year? And then, what is the known and unknown risk factors that they are assuming in order to do that business? But one thing I'm not clear about is: so, how would the blockchain, like you know, let's say you had a a, a a poor payer, right? Or, or somebody that was seven months behind. How, what's, what's, how is a blockchain going to? Well, because, that, you know? because one of the big things that Countrywide and, and some of these other servicing companies who I, who I won't name, Countrywide's easy because I can beat them up because they don't exist anymore. Yeah, sure. Um, but, you know, there's, there's other servicing companies that just recently have had very large fines because they're foreclosing on people's houses who actually aren't behind on their payments. Or they're charging fees against a loan that aren't part of the lending contract. That cannot happen on blockchain. It's a binary differential. It simply cannot happen. You cannot have a contract tell you that it needs to go into foreclosure unless it's actually, you know, 90 days back and has a notice of default filed in another 90 days. And, and then artificial it intelligence that is blockchain, you know, is that is is repl is replacing the stupid person at Wells Fargo wherever that that is making mistakes for closing on people that have paid or correct charging a late and, fee to someone that has paid and mitigating compounded mistakes because remember these notes are sold four or five times through different entities through different yes. holding companies over that period of time so you don't just have the issue of hey did Joe screw something up. You have did Joe and Sally and Russell and Tim <laughs> screw something up three times before I even touch this dang thing, right? I and get it, yeah. That, that risk mitigation goes away. And um, I don't know what the value of that is, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be good. And I'm it's banking. It's a lot of jobs. It's a lot of jobs that a lot of human beings that are touching that touching that loan, right? I mean, there is, yeah. there is. And you have these, these, these situations where it simply doesn't need to be. 
right? Let's take the mail carrier, for example. Like, you know, uh, Donald Trump wants to beat up Amazon and beat up Amazon about the mail rates they pay. But the fact of the matter is, is that without Amazon, the post office probably doesn't have enough volume to justify what they're doing over there, right? Because we as humans automatically, uh, over time, but we will go to the easiest way of doing things. We will go to the, and so we, and back to that email conversation. We now send billions and billions, trillions of emails a day in, in between people that has allowed us to remove the mail carrier from that transaction, right? So we remove a truck that picked up the mail. We remove a processing center that processed the mail. We remove another truck that took that mail from that processing center to a distribution center. We remove the employees from that distribution center who send it out to a mail carrier. We remove the mail carrier who has to take that out to your house. You remove that entire sequence of events and simply, I send my message from me to you right now. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's just what's going to happen. And if, if Amazon, you know, starts just dropping stuff off with drones or what have you, then that's just, it is what it is. And the post office just shuts down post office and, and trucks and sells their truck. I mean, it's, you just got to let it happen. We don't, have the pon- we don't have the Pony Express anymore for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so let's wrap this up with a piece of advice for real estate agents, Joe, like what, what, if, if, you know, if you had to give everybody some advice on, you know, how not to be blindsided by the blockchain, um, as a real estate agent and to be aware of what would that be? Um, I, I would, I would really look, uh, I would just pay attention. You know, it's easy to say, Oh, Bitcoin is who we, and you know, all these people are just trying to make money. And, and, and then again, like I said before, I've never bought a cryptocurrency. I don't plan on starting today, but you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because if, if you're paying attention and if you are doing some of your research, there are going to be the realtors who are able to come out of this as the people who understand this language, know what's going on, can communicate it to their buyers and build themselves a position in the new economy for this disruption that's coming. I do not believe that the real estate agent is going to go away. Just like I don't believe that the internet killed the car salesman, right? In 2000, 2000, 2001 was, oh, the internet's going to kill the car salesman. Everyone's going to buy their cars online. Not true. I want to sit in my truck. I want to smell the leather. I want somebody to show me how all these buttons work, you know? So the real estate agent, I don't believe is going the way of the Dota. Um, I think that what happens is as with any industry, um, the cream rises to the top and are there going to be a, you know, first of all, do you have several years ahead of you before any of this disruption really impacts the, the, the day to day real torf side of the transactions? Absolutely. I think the title people are in for a closer disruption. I think, you know, the county recorder systems are, ob- it's, it's such an obvious fit. Like that's, th- those are going to go, 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 go that way first. Um, but I think the, the folks who come into this and sit down and say, the technology underneath this is very, very cool. I want to understand more about it. And from a sales perspective, it's about understanding a language right? Every business has its own language. Every technology has its own lingo. And the folks that can sit down with their clients and if a client asks them, well, you know, I actually, you know, I had put five grand or 10 grand into Bitcoin when it was a hundred bucks. And now I've got a million dollars sitting over here and I want to buy a property with it. And they're able to say, you know what? I've heard of that before. I know that it is possible. Let's work through it together. Those people are going to win and they're going to get a following and traction and all those other positive things, right? There's a, there's a win there. Wow. Yeah. I love it, man. Well, Joe, this has been awesome. Why don't you um, touch a little bit on your free gift? As you know, everybody that comes on my show brings a free gift, something of value that our listeners can learn from uh, and use in their daily lives. What, uh, what, what's your free gift? My, my free gift is to be open to change. And I think as salespeople, one of the things that we end up doing in many, many cases is doing things the way that we did them (laughs) because we know how to do them that way. And I I would reach out to your listeners and say, be especially now with the things that are coming on, um, be open to change. Because the people that fought email, the people that fought cell phones, the people that fought e-signature, you know, those folks had had a tough time and are continuing to have a tough time. Being wide open to change, 
and, and, and disruption in your space gives you power. It's not a threat. It's a power play. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, guys, um, you can't download that or get it in the agent toolbox, but it is a valuable, valuable piece of advice for you there. Joe, thank you. I want to put all of Joe's information. If you want to reach out to him, uh, at hybendigital.com backslash Lannister. That's the name of his company. It's L-A-N-N-I-S-T-E-R. That's hybendigital.com backslash Lannister. All his contact information will be there if you want to reach out and say hi um, or check out his uh, company, Lannister Capital, which does uh, and will be doing loans to uh, through the blockchain. Uh, so, um, so that's it, Joe. Listen, if I'm ever in Phoenix, Arizona, I will definitely look you up and we can break some bread. That sounds fantastic, man. Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. I hope you have a great day. Thank you, sir. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to Real Estate Rockstars. If this free content is giving you a ton of value, I want to ask a small favor in return. I need you to pull out your pointing finger and hit the subscribe button. Yes, hit subscribe, please. The more subscribers that we get on Real Estate Rockstars, the better guests are attracted to the shows. We'll get more guests from the top companies, from the top teams, and even more celebrity guests like Robert Kiyosaki and Barbara Corcoran. Also, if you're not a member of our free Facebook group, go to Real Estate Rockstars Radio right on Facebook and join the conversation. I'm on there myself on FaceTime Lives, and we have a lot of communications and questions about the show, and I'd love to see you there. And it's free. People ask me all the time, where am I on social media? I'm real easy to find. Just type in my name. My IG is I am Pat Hyben. It is blowing up on Instagram, adding tons of subscribers. And I'm on there probably twice a day. So definitely follow me on Instagram, as well as everywhere else. Thanks again for listening, and keep rocking.